Okay, I think I'm about ready to get this started. Maybe, hopefully, if I don't end up having a coronary event before this is all over. But we're going to try and get this started now. Hello, Shadowcat back, and we have another lecture today. This time a viewer request, so let's hope that I can do it justice. Let me make sure that everything is working. I am so incredibly late today because I am currently in the middle of a household of four children, two adult children, and two dogs that act like children. And absolutely none of the eight of those have any kind of volume control, so if you hear any kind of background noise, uh, well, that's what it is. It's going to be a good day. If I survive this at all. So, I think we'll give people a minute to kind of filter in if they so choose to. I can already see that Blizzard Star is in the chat. Hello, Blizz. Good to see you here. Anybody else who might be listening in, if you have not subscribed to Blizzard Star's channel, go check it out. She does gaming stuff over there. It's good. I do gaming stuff too, but she does different gaming stuff. Except for the things we do together. Those are the same gaming stuff. Take a look anyway. Okay, let's see. I think I've got this posted pretty much everywhere I needed to. I've already screwed everything up tomorrow. i got to reschedule tomorrow's live stream because I accidentally se uh, selected that live stream and then had to end it because it's like, what, wait, what do you mean it's supposed to be, or it's supposed to be uh, on, on April 2nd? Oh, this is the wrong live stream. So, yeah. Bad times. Bad times. Ah, <sighs> I guess we can take off the starting soon. We are started. That'll go away now. And so, yeah. Let's start this discussion. Um... So it was suggested that we cover the philosophy of My Little Pony, and you would think that the philosophy of My Little Pony is going to be kind of basic, right? After all, My Little Pony, friendship is magic. What, what, is, what is our overarching theme here? Well, it's going to be friendship, right? As it turns out, though, it's not. Friendship may, in fact, be a central theme to the entire show. That is true. It's as much of a central theme as the idea of magic. And, of course, you have both of those in equal measure because friendship is magic. Obviously. But if we had to look at the overall philosophy of My Little Pony across the nine generations that the show spanned, turns out that friendship is only a very, very small part of it. So what is it about? Well, if you were to follow any one character, you could follow their each individual story arcs. And they all do have them, and we all will, or we will touch on all of them as we go through this. But there is a reason why, I guess I'll go ahead and resize this now that we don't have the, uh, the, the starting soon on there. Put that right there. And we'll just make this bigger. There's a reason why I wanted to start today with a quote. Quite simply, um from, I think it's like, is it the book of Corinthians? I don't know, it's from Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, what does that mean? Of course, there's going to be many different interpretations of that, but by and large, it just means that at some point, you have to grow up. At some point, you have to do away with all those things that you were allowed because of, you know, being a child. Things that were tolerated when you were a child. But now that you have grown up, it's time to take responsibility and to put away childish things. And if there was one singular overarching theme, one singular philosophy to be found in My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic... I would say it is encapsulated in this one quote. Because when you look at the entire series of My Little Pony Generation 4, the overall philosophy, the overall theme, 
is growing up. While it is true that every character has their own trials, their own tribulations, every single character that we come across, whether they be the main characters or the side characters, every single one of them is meant to represent an aspect, a facet of childhood. Whether this is a flaw of some kind that we need to overcome, or an ambition that needs temperance, these are all things that, almost universally, we all understand. We all have known the, the outsider feeling of Twilight Sparkle. We've all known the competitiveness of Rainbow Dash. We've all known the shyness of Fluttershy, the excitement to Pinkie Pie, the creativity of Rarity, and the burdens of Applejack. These are not unique to, eat to any one person. We've all known these things. And in fact, there is a character in the show who perfectly exemplifies not just this universal facet of the show, but who also is our placeholder to take us along through the same journey. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Before we get to that, though, I want to go ahead and start with the main characters, because as I pointed out, Every single one of the main characters represents a part of us that we experienced in our childhood, something that we had to rise above, to conquer, and to, you know, we, we, we had to just deal with it before we could really find ourselves as a fully realized adult. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to put this away. Blip. It's all gone now. And we're going to pull out our visual aids for the day. And the visual aids are going to be really nice. Top-notch stuff. Assuming, of course, that I can get it to work. There we go. I'm good at this. See? Perfectly centered and everything. There we go. Alright. So, we are starting off with... Twilight Sparkle. Let me go ahead and close that. I didn't need to be there. Now, Twilight Sparkle, of course, is the main character of the story. She was a unicorn who grew up in the lofty city of Canterlot, showed extreme potential, and ended up being taken under the wing of the most powerful ruler that Equestria has ever known. Her story is one of being the outsider, moving to a new place, having to meet new people to fit in, and to wrestle with her own inadequacies and her own struggles to finally become a fully realized person. When we, um, when we first meet Twilight in the beginning of the series, she is an introverted bookworm with no real aspirations of any kind of social contact, more or less. She does have some, but what she does have is very, very little. Her only primary concerns are her aspirations to live up to the expectations of her mentor and her own studies. That's all she cares about. So then she's thrown from her own little goldfish bowl into a bigger pond. And let's face it, Ponyville is just a pond. It's not really anything more than that. And then she has to struggle with everything else. Now, this is a story that is not entirely unknown to most people. I mean, many of us have had to move in our childhoods. Many of us have had to leave friends behind, make new friends in other places. But we look at Twilight Sparkle as an overall character. What, what do we know about her? She is neurotic. She doesn't handle change very well. She's a perfectionist. Anything that she does, she does to perfection. Otherwise, 
it's inadequate, it's improper, it's wrong, and it must be fixed. And she does this to an obsessive degree. She obsesses over everything. And these are all things that many of us have had to deal with. Whether it's been a change in circumstance that we were not comfortable with, or it's something that we have a true passion for, and we just are not willing to compromise on things. These are things that we've all had to deal with before. And of course, over the over nine seasons, we see Twilight have to deal with this. Not only with the mounting expectations on top of her, but how to deal with those expectations on their own. Of course, Twilight Sparkle learns that her neuroses, while they are part of her, do not need to control everything. She learns to be more calm, let's say. She learns different calming techniques. She learns different management styles. She learns how to, even if she can't stop herself from feeling them, she learns how to at least cope. And of course, coping skills are something that we all have to learn. All of us have our own little things that we deal with on a daily basis. Some of us have more than others. But regardless, we all have to learn how to deal with them. And so that's a great big part of her journey. The, another thing that she has to deal with is her perfectionism and her obsessive nature. And both of those are handled in more or less the same way. While none of this ever really goes away through the course of, you know, nine seasons, in fact, what the very last episode has her dealing with this all over again because what should be like the greatest moment of her life, what needs to be perfect, it's not. And it's, it's not perfect by any means. In fact, it may go down as one of the greatest, uh, the, the greatest flops ever. But it's not about it being perfect. It's about accepting that things are never going to be perfect. Nothing ever is. If you inspect anything hard enough, you'll see that it has flaws. The key is to accept the flaws. To accept that things are never going to be absolutely, utterly perfect. And that obsessing over that is neither helpful nor healthy. Sometimes you just have to accept it and move on. So this is the, by and large, the character arc that Twilight Sparkle goes through. Where's my mouse at? There's my mouse. Next up, let's see, where is it? No, no, there. Let's talk about Rainbow Dash. Rainbow Dash is also, also another character we meet day one. One of the first people that um, Twilight Sparkle meets when she gets to Ponyville. And what do we know about, Twi or about uh, Rainbow Dash? Well, Rainbow Dash kind of flips like a switch. Rainbow Dash is kind of lazy, generally speaking. But what happens when Rainbow Dash is not lazy? Well, Rainbow Dash will immediately do everything to the maximum. The faster it can be done, the sooner it can be done. Just all out. Rainbow Dash does not have anything between 1 and 11. And because of that, because there is nothing between 1 and 11, it leads Rainbow Dash to be rather impulsive. Uh, also rather brash many times. Rainbow Dash has a tendency to either act or speak without thinking. On the flip side of that, though, because Rainbow Dash only has 1 or 11, whenever it's not 11, it's got to be 1, which leads Rainbow Dash to be rather lazy, rather inattentive, often seen to not be paying attention or not doing anything at all. This is not something that many of us are unfamiliar with. We've all done things before we've thought about them, said things before we've thought about them. Conscientiousness is something that has to be cultivated. 
And so, what do we see from Rainbow Dash over the course of the series? Well, between all the competitions and the events and learning how other people feel, learning empathy, learning consideration, Rainbow Dash goes from being either a lazy or impulsive Pegasus to learning restraint. She doesn't need to act on every impulse as soon as she feels it. Rather, when she feels an impulse, it takes restraint to stop and then think about what she needs to do before she does it. Now, this will be further exemplified when we get into the different ponies' careers later on. Because we will go through that. But for the time being, we'll just leave it at the fact that basically, Starter Dash had no filter. Not on words, not on actions. And she wasn't the only one like that. But it was something that we all need to learn. None of us none of us have this ability when we're born. We have to learn it over time. So that's Rainbow Dash. And of course she does learn this over time. By the end of the story she's actually a very considerate, very empathetic pony. After that, we have the other side of that coin. Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie is actually the very first person that uh, Twilight Sparkle meets when she gets to Ponyville. Uh, they literally run into each other on the street, and Pinkie Pie responds with a gasp and bolting without a single actual word uttered. Why? Well, because Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie are great friends for a reason. They are nearly identical when it comes to personality. Nearly because they do have their differences. But one thing they do share is impulsiveness. Again, much like Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie will often act without thinking. She'll often speak without thinking. There's no filter there between brain and action, whatever that action may be. That has led to more than a few instances of hurt feelings here and there, especially when she doesn't know when to quit. Pinkie Pie does not exactly take social cues very well. In addition to that, however, Pinkie Pie has one thing that many of us are familiar with, and that is incredibly low self-esteem. Pinkie Pie may, may be the most outgoing, boisterous pony in the entire show, and yet her self-esteem is, by and large, as fragile as an egg. It, it does not take much to deflate the Pinkie, and in fact it has happened on many occasions. In general, it happens whenever she makes assumptions and just kind of spirals down that way. Uh, the episode, which episode was it? I forget. I have a list of them here, just as a reference. Which one was it? It was... Oh, there it is. Party of One, right. Party of One, and I can't believe I forgot that episode. That episode is infamous. But Party of One was the episode where Pinky learned that, you know, y you can't just assume the worst. Just because people aren't telling you things doesn't necessarily mean they're plotting against you or they've abandoned you in some way. Because at the end of the day, she was her own worst enemy. She went to a dark place because she allowed herself to go to a dark place. Because she kind of drove herself there. And this is not something that's unfamiliar to any of us either. All of us have done this at some point in our lives. Uh, you can't deny it, we've all done it. You've all gotten a text message and assumed the worst. You've all gotten a phone call and maybe you didn't want to pick it up because you saw who was on the other line. We've all done things and then avoided facing up to the answers of it because, well, we just we, we couldn't handle the answers. 
Of course, she learned later on in the show that there is only really one way to deal with these things, and that is to confront them. To finally just act instead of assuming. But it was a hard lesson learned. So that's Pinkie Pie, and we'll come back to her later because she does actually get very interesting. Next up, we have, ah, this one. We have Fluttershy. Now, Fluttershy was essentially the case study of, uh, of therapy across the, the entire show. Mostly because Fluttershy's character flaws are not many. But she struggles with them probably more than anyone else in the show. Because Fluttershy's character flaws are... Two. Similar to Pinkie Pie, she has exceptionally low self-esteem. Fluttershy is usually the first person to criticize herself and the last person to accept any kind of praise at all. Mostly because she has a low self-image, and it is firmly ingrained. Now, to top all of this off, she's also shy, as the name would imply. We can debate later on whether or not this was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, if your parents are going to go ahead and name you shy... You're really only going to go one of two ways, let's be honest. You're either going to live up to the name, or you're going to live against the name. She lived up to it, to an extreme degree. However, just because she was, does not necessarily mean that she is. There's a difference between being quiet and being shy. Fluttershy will always be the quiet one in every single implication of that word. When they say beware the quiet ones, yes, you will beware the Fluttershy. More importantly though, at the beginning of the show, Fluttershy was essentially incapable of speaking to anyone. To a literal degree. That there were times when people would actually ask her things, like I do believe it was the first episode, where Twilight tried to ask her her name. And it essentially reduced Fluttershy to tears. This is clinically diagnosable crippling shyness. This is like, th th this is a, uh, what, what is, what would the pro be the proper diagnosis? Um, oh, I can't think of the top of my head, but basically she needed therapy. She didn't get it either, but she did manage to work through it with the help of her friends. She, over time, did learn how to assert herself in situations, whether that was to stand her ground and have a simple conversation, or even to go so far as to push back against people who were actively taking advantage of her. Part of that assertiveness came from overcoming her shyness, Part of that came from conquering her low self-esteem. The fact was that Fluttershy was always good at the things she was good at doing, just like we are. We all have our own strengths and weaknesses. If you judge yourself by the ability to lift weights and then you compare yourself to a weightlifter, we're all going to look paltry in comparison. Similarly, if you have a problem with your self-image and you spend your time looking at beauty magazines and Instagram, you're going to have a continuing issue with your own self-image. Having confidence requires you to actually recognize what is good about yourself and what you can be proud of. What, what, what do you bring to the table? Which was a lesson that Fluttershy had to learn. And so as we understand it, as we're going through all these ponies, recognize that every single one of these facets is something that we have experienced in our life, and we're not done yet. So let's take that away for the moment. 
And we'll bring up our next. Our next pony, of course, is Marshmallow, otherwise known as Rarity. Now, Rarity is actually kind of interesting. In fact, these last two on the list are actually very interesting. And the reason they're very interesting is because while the others are getting by, essentially, the last two on this list, by the time we meet them, both have flourishing businesses. Rarity, of course, is the first one we're going to discuss, because by the time we meet Rarity, Rarity is what I would call, at the very minimum, an amateur seamstress. The fact is that while we don't really get a whole lot of explanation for how many of the ponies in the main cast subsist, like, I don't know where um, Rainbow Dash gets money. Well, actually, no, I take it back. I do know where Rainbow Dash gets money. That's a bad example. I don't know where Fluttershy gets money. What we do know about Fluttershy is that she she does a few odd jobs here and there, but by and large, where does Pinkie Pie get money? Where does Twilight get money? I mean, I can assume that maybe Twilight gets a stipend from her mentor, given that her mentor is the princess of the entire kingdom. But when it comes to Rarity and the next one on the list, we know where Rarity gets her money. Rarity operates her own boutique. It's the Carousel Boutique in Ponyville. She does custom tailoring. She makes dresses, she makes coats, she makes saddles, she makes everything. So you would look at Rarity and say, well, I mean, she's very successful, yes? So what what issues does she possibly have that we're going to relate to? I mean, I, I cannot tell you the last time I had to worry about the price per, per bolt of fabric. The fact is that Rarity has a problem with obsession, primarily. She has many good qualities. She knows what her good qualities are. And she tries to use them to her advantage. She does so because she is a creative person. She knows she's a creative person. She is an excellent uh, seamstress. Her special specialty is, of course, gems. Hence, the diamonds on her butt. She is able to incorporate gems into almost anything. And she does on a regular basis. Her problem, however, is that she is so very eager to please that she'll often do so at her own expense. Rarity is one of those people that has a really, really hard time taking no, or rather giving no for an answer. If somebody comes in with an order, she wants to fulfill it. And it's not out of some kind of obligation. It's not because this person may owe her something. It's because it's what she wants to do, and because sometimes she has a hard time moderating it. In general, this is not really a big problem. I mean, after all, she owns a successful boutique. She does a very good job keeping herself in business. She has a really hard time, however, in turning people away. We've seen many times that Rarity is probably one of the first people to actually get overwhelmed. Because if too many orders come in, she doesn't want to tell anybody no, she wants to fulfill them all. And later on, when she started expanding her business, she wanted to have a, a part in all of it. After all, it was her business, and it simply grew to the point where she really could not handle all of it at the same time. Her problem is that she cannot moderate herself. She, of course, did learn later on, but we have all taken on more than we can, or bitten off more than we can chew at some point in our lives. Either because we didn't think there was going to be that much, or because maybe we just felt obligated for some reason. 
And even though we've all heard this story many times before, we all do it anyway. Because we all say that, No, I got this. I got this. When in fact, we don't got this. So, we have Rarity. And of course Rarity does learn over time that she does need to say no sometimes. Whether that's no to one extra order that she cannot fulfill, or it's no to a client who simply wants something that's unrealistic. She learns how to say no, and she even learns how to delegate later on, to say, I need help. And speaking of help, we may as well get to the last item on the list. And that would be... The perfect pony. Let's face it, Applejack is perfect. Enough said. Applejack started off the series with her own business. She ended the series with her own business. Applejack does everything right. Applejack doesn't need help. Okay, that may be like the one point where we actually have to go against. Because Applejack has one, exactly one, character flaw. And that is pride. Specifically, overconfidence. She is confident in herself to a fault, and not without reason. Applejack was born on an apple farm. Her entire family has, done, her, has run an apple farm forever. They know everything there is to know about farming apples. She was born doing it, she grew up doing it, and once she got old enough, she took over leading the entire thing. However, that gave her a certain degree of confidence that was also her Achilles heel. Many of us have stated that, you know, we, I got this. I don't need anybody to tell me how to do something. I don't need anybody to point out what I'm doing. And I definitely do not need anybody to tell me that I'm doing something wrong. I know what I'm doing. Those are the second most famous last words before hold my beer. And that is a lesson that AJ had to learn over time because in several instances, her confidence got the better of her. I heard her element, of course, was honesty. and She was always honest. And when she said that she's got this, she honestly believed it. But just because she believed it, didn't make it true. So, whenever that happened, she had to have people come and bail her out. Whether that was her brother, whether that was her friends, whether it was somebody else, she had to get bailed out. Over time, she did learn that. She learned to be more humble. She learned humility. So that before she got in over her head, she would ask for help ahead of time and say, I have something um, coming up. I am almost certain I can handle all of it. But just in case, perhaps I should ask for help first. And that's really her only flaw. And it is something that she dealt with over time. So that's all of our main six ponies. Okay? But there is still one other character that we need to talk about, because I've, as I've told you, every single one of these ponies er, expresses some facet of who we are and who we have been in our past. But there is still one left for us to discuss. And that is the audience stand-in. The one that we're actually supposed to relate to because he's there for all of us. For everything that we've experienced, we can experience in the show through him. And that is Spike. Now, Spike is actually very important to this entire theme. Why? Because as I pointed out, the entire philosophy of My Little Pony is growing up. And that means that, on a certain level, the entire series of My Little Pony 
is the story of Spike. Now, why is that? Well, we don't necessarily see it in the very first episode, but the entire series started. The entire thing started when he was born. Now, he wasn't the catalyst for all of this, but he is the one who has been there through the entire thing. In, uh, let's see, I forget which episode it is, but we find out that there was the simultaneous gaining of their cutie marks, all because of the Sonic Rain Boom. It's the one thing, the one event that gave every one of the main six their cutie mark at the same time, and because of that, he was hatched. And as soon as he was hatched, he was given to Twilight, when Twilight wasn't even mature enough yet to take care of her building blocks. I'm not here to question the way equestrians run things. I'm just saying it's a little bit suspicious. Regardless, though, Spike encapsulates everything that we've seen so far. And I'm going to go through it one at a time. When we're looking at Spike, Twilight Sparkle's neuroses, perfectionism, and obsessive nature. Spike has all of them. Now, perhaps some of that is carried over simply from the fact that he spends the most time with Twilight, but he has all of them. He is neurotic. He doesn't handle change very well. He'll handle somebody else's change just fine. He didn't mind too much when it came to going to Ponyville. But whenever something in his life changes, it's difficult. And yes, he is somehow, well, when it comes, when it comes to certain things, he is every bit the perfectionist and the obsessive that Twilight is, to a fault. He has to learn all the same lessons that Twilight does. Rainbow Dash is impulsive and lazy. Brash and yet also inattentive sometimes. All these are traits that Twilight, or not Twilight, that Spike has expressed over time. Spike is an example of Newtonian physics. When he gets going, he is an object in motion that will not be stopped unless something stops him. When he is at rest, he doesn't want to move. And learning how to handle both of these things it's part of him growing up. The same thing is also true for his relationship with Pinkie Pie. I, on almost all the same things. He also can sometimes have no filter, just like she doesn't. He also enjoys many of the same things, which some of them can be quite, uh, quite childish sometimes. But he is a child, so it is somewhat acceptable. When it comes to Fluttershy, he doesn't have the same crippling shyness that she does or the same extent of her low self-esteem and self-image. But he does have it. Part of that is him being a dragon living among ponies. Part of that is the fact that he doesn't really have any other role models around him to learn from, and so he has to learn many of these lessons himself. But he does have the same shyness, and he does have the same low self-esteem, which at times has become crippling where it has stopped him from, from acting because he did not know how else to handle it. He does share Rarity's obsessive nature and her creativity, not to mention he's absolutely infatuated with her, which is where much of the shyness comes in. And when it comes to his pride, much like Applejack, well, when it comes to something he thinks that he can do well, usually involving Twilight asking him to take on a project that's well out of his ability, He's never going to say no. Not only does every single other pony have to learn their lessons, Spike has had to learn every single one of their lessons. All of them. On him. Why? Well, because he is, in fact, a child. Every single one of the, the ponies, it has been implied... If not, you know, opaquely in the case of Rarity and Applejack and Rainbow Dash, well, and for that matter, also Fluttershy, they have all been shown to be independent. They don't have parents looming over them. 
And in fact, in the case of Applejack, they don't have parents. They don't have anybody else taking care of them so much. Nobody is providing their food or anything else like that. They are self-sufficient. Twilight is also self-sufficient, but how much she's being subsidized is up for negotiation. And Pinkie Pie is absolutely not. Pinkie Pie lives in the upstairs of um, Sugar Cube Corner. Now, does that mean that she could not be self-sufficient? I don't know. We're never shown that she's incapable of it, just that that's where she lives. Spike is not. Spike is a child in every single way that we can imagine one. He is entirely reliant on Twilight and, to a lesser extent, everybody else around him, which in this case is generally most of the main six. Spike is our audience surrogate. When we watch, when we see all the hijinks and everything happening, he is us if we were in that circumstance. And, you know, a lot tougher than we actually are because most of us wouldn't survive the punishment he gets put through. As such, not when he learns a lesson, it's implied that we should also be learning a lesson. I mean, that that those first couple of seasons, every single letter to Celestia that was written was supposed to be a lesson for us to learn. And for whichever ponies were involved there, whether that was Twilight, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Fluttershy, Rarity, Applejack, that's fine. But there was one other person who was always there to learn that lesson as well. And it was the one taking notes. It was Spike. So, now that we've gone through all the different characters, I want to go through their careers. And sorry, Spike, we're going to have to put you away for now. We don't really need to bring them back up. We're just going to go through all their careers now, one at a time. Because part of growing up is taking responsibility. This is partially taking responsibility for ourselves and saying that we have childish natures and we need to conquer those childish natures. We need to be more mature and better people. But it also means taking responsibility. Now, these are usually small things. Like when we grow up, maybe we don't have to worry about sweeping the floor. But as soon as you're old enough to really handle a broom, why shouldn't you be responsible for sweeping the floor? After all, someday, there's not going to be anyone else to sweep the floor. It's going to be you. And so you better learn now to do so. Part of this is going to be conquering our own different neuroses in various aspects of our childhood. After all, as we established, Rainbow Dash is lazy. But there comes a time when you have to you you have to stop being lazy. And you can't count on somebody else to do it. You have to do it yourself. The same thing is true when you finally grow up old enough and you are you need to stop letting other people take care of you. You have to be able to take care of yourself. And so this is where we get into what did the main six do, and how did they cultivate it? We're going to, of course, start with Twilight Sparkle. And Twilight Sparkle, as we've already touched on, was a student, okay? Like, if you were going to give Twilight Sparkle a real-world equivalent, Twilight Sparkle would be a career student. She would be that student that, like, spends 20, maybe 30 years in school just taking class upon class upon class, getting degree upon degree upon certificate, upon masters, upon whatever. <laughs> Twilight was a career student. But of course, what happened later? Well, the more she was a student, the more knowledge she accrued, the more problems she was able to solve. 
What happened was that even if she didn't go looking for it, she became a person that people could come to whenever they had problems, and eventually she would be sent out to fix those problems. What ended up happening is that she grew, and once she realized that she had the capability of, of doing these things, of solving people's problems, of imparting knowledge, once she accepted that, she became a teacher. Because this was ultimately the culmination of everything that she had been doing. She could continue to be a student, for everybody to give her knowledge, to impart wisdom upon her, it became time for her to give back. For her to become part of the community as a contributing member. And there you go. She became a teacher and eventually even opened her own school. We don't need to go too much into the school, how it functioned, what it did. The point is that she became a teacher and instead of collecting knowledge now, she be began imparting it. For Rainbow Dash, Rainbow Dash was actually a little bit different. As I mentioned before, Rainbow Dash is one of those few ponies that we knew was actually kind of supporting themselves. I mentioned that we don't know how, um, <clears throat> how Twilight Sparkle was supporting herself, nor Pinkie Pie, but Rainbow Dash? We know Rainbow Dash because Rainbow Dash was part of the weather team. You have to remember that in My Little Pony, the weather isn't random. The weather is actually designed. They have factories that produce clouds. Pegasi can use clouds to form whatever weather they need, whether it's storms and rain or wind, or they can actually just get rid of the clouds and have a sunny day. Rainbow Dash worked on the weather team. She essentially was working a 9 to 5 job. Or whatever the hours happened to be. She was your pretty typical person. She worked on the weather team. She had a schedule. She had a job. She had to show up to her job. She had to do the work. And then what did she do? Well, in her downtime, what did we see that Rainbow Dash liked to do? Well, she spent her time hanging out with friends. She was a very social person. She was also a bit of a sports person. Specifically in two ways. Number one, there's a ball game. I forget what it's called, but there is a sports game played by ponies. It requires you to have Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi all on the same team, and they throw a ball back and forth and try to catch it in a bucket. It's great. She's actually really good at it. And so, given her competitive nature, she liked to watch it, she liked to play it. But, she always, because she is a dedicated flyer, she always had a special eye for a group called the Wonderbolts. The Wonderbolts, of course, being the My Little Pony equivalent of the Blue Angels. Essentially, she wanted to be an ace pilot. And so what happened? Well, she tried to get in. And failed. Why'd she fail? Well, because she wasn't ready for it. Remember what I said about impulsivity, about... That, that brashness about everything else. Yeah, turns out if you're going to work on a team and if you're going to actually perform, those are things that kind of get in the way. And so when we go back and we talk about how they had to grow over time. This is one of those cases. In order for Rainbow Dash to actually achieve what she wanted, she had to grow up. She had to go from being a child to being an adult. And that meant that childish things, like acting out, had to be put away. And what happened when she did? Well, she made it. And it was that easy. When she stopped acting like a child and she focused on what she could do on her skills, suddenly... She was everything that they ever wanted. She was basically on the team the next day. Not only that, but she was able to simultaneously see her own flaws in other people and try to help them with them as well. 
Next up was Pinkie Pie. Now, Pinkie Pie, as far as I can tell, didn't have much of a career. Or a job, really. She had two jobs, as far as I can tell. And neither one of them seemed to be very full-time. She was a party planner. That was her passion. She loved to meet people, loved to throw celebrations. That, that was her thing. We even saw later that she had a party planning dungeon. But that's not exactly a full-time gig. However, it would lead into other things down the road. We also know that she was an accomplished baker. She did not do most of the work when it came to Sugar Cube Corner, but she did help out from time to time. Presumably, she was getting paid from that in some way, or perhaps that's how she was paying for the room that she was staying in upstairs. We don't know. Either way, though, we know that she was a very social person, a very creative person. She was just similar to App or similar to Rainbow Dash, very impulsive and abrasive sometimes. So what did we do next? Well, she largely didn't change too much over the course of the series. But she did at the end of the series, because at the end of the series, when they begin traveling more, she begins to meet other cultures. For example, she meets the Yaks. And she has to learn their culture. She has to learn how to integrate with them and how to communicate with them. She goes and she meets other pe or other ponies in different areas, like she met Cheese Sandwich when he was running his own factory. She began to go out and make contact with different people in different regions on behalf of, well, Equestria. So what did that lead into? Well, because she was so very good at traveling and meeting people, because she was a social person willing to do almost anything to just kind of make a connection there, it made her the perfect candidate for an ambassador later on. Now, becoming an ambassador meant that she had to put on a certain, a certain air of dignity. She had to be restrained. She had to do all of these things, and she had to cultivate these things over time. No more impulsiveness. You can't just burst into a meeting some and shoot confetti somewhere. Not when you're actually representing somebody as important as your entire nation. That didn't mean that there wasn't good times for that. There were. If you were going to throw a party, nobody throws a party like Pinky. But at the same time, there is a time to put childish things away, and you must act like an adult. Fluttershy. Fluttershy, as far as I can tell, never had a job. She's one of those that I'm pretty sure just did odd jobs. Like, if your pet is sick, you take it to Fluttershy. Is Fluttershy a vet? Nope. Is Fluttershy trained in some way? Nope. Is there like, are there any credentials with which that we should trust Fluttershy? Absolutely not. However, we do know from experience that Fluttershy knows basically everything there is to know about animals. So, she was kind of the, not, not, not the default, but at least maybe the de facto animal care specialist in Ponyville. Turns out there is actually a vet in Ponyville. But everyone goes to Fluttershy first because she's good at it. So I have to assume that Fluttershy simply subsists on whatever tips she's given. She's basically just a freelance vet without the qualifications. And of course, she's happy to do this because it means that she never has to go outside. She generally doesn't have to take care of people. If somebody brings her a sick cat, she doesn't need to talk to the person at all. She just takes care of the cat. What happens later on, though, after she begins to conquer her shyness and to become more confident and more assertive, is she starts to capitalize on what she's good at. She has a raw, natural talent for animals. And this ends up with her, over the course of a, a large amount of time, creating an entire nature preserve. 
to either care for or protect different species. And of course, what does she do? Well, being the premier expert on all these different animals, and now with a certain degree of confidence behind her, she's warden of an entire nature preserve. Every single animal in there is her responsibility. By conquering these things in her childhood, she moves on to become something greater in her future. Much like any of us have done. I mean, sure, maybe you got a job when you were smaller, you were like delivering papers. You're already good at that. Maybe you have a bicycle, maybe you have a car. And if, you, if you're delivering papers, then perhaps you step your game up to delivering pizzas? And after that, maybe you go to work for a place like uh, the post office. Who knows? But either way, you can step things up. That's what she did. Then there's Rarity. Now, Rarity, I already struggled to differentiate whether she was an amateur seamstress or a professional seamstress. My ruling has always been this. If you do something for fun and you're not getting paid for it, you are a hobbyist. If you're getting paid for something, but it's not enough to live on, you're an amateur. If you are making enough to live on, though, you're a professional now. So, I am, of course, an amateur YouTuber. I know, I know. Kind of sounds like I'm selling myself short, but... While I do make a small amount of money doing this... It is not even close. It's not even enough to feed myself for a week. I, I could feed myself for a few days. And that's to say nothing of other bills that I have. So, she is what I would call an amateur. Or a an amateur or a professional seamstress. She does seem to be supporting herself fairly well. But I don't know the full extent of it. And of course, that's the beginning. After all, Rarity was, you know, kind of a hard one to pin down when it came to character flaws because she is very self-sufficient. And over the course of the series, what do we get by the end? Well, towards seasons uh, seven or eight, I think, we see that she's opening up a multitude of boutiques in other places. I think she has three or four of them by the time the series is done. And that's even before the very last episode. But I think by the time, the, or before the last episode, she already has three or four of them. And not only that, but she's managing them. And she's even got help in them. And in fact, part of her character journey is learning that she cannot run all of them by herself. She needs the help. But this involves her stepping out of her comfort zone taking command of what she can do to expand it. That means that she has to get rid of her obsessions and, and her own neuroses and various things. Then there's Applejack. I said it before, I'll say it again. Applejack is perfect, nothing needs to change. Realistically speaking, though, um, nothing really changes for Applejack. She was a farmer at the beginning, she remains a farmer at the end. The only thing that changes is that, in the beginning, the Apple family is Apple Bloom, the youngest, Apple Jack, of course, our, our main character, her big brother, Big Mac, and then Granny Smith. While it's never outright stated in the series, at some point... Applejack had to take over the entire farm as the matriarch of the farm. It was implied that Big Mac, while he would always be there, had no real interest or maybe not even the capability of running the farm. He was good to actually run it when it came to getting work done, but the logistical side of it... It's not always implied that he was able to do that. Not to mention that he did actually have other interests outside of the farm, and we're not entirely sure what came of that. 
We also know that Apple Bloom wasn't going to be taking care of that because Apple Bloom had other responsibilities, even as a filly. So, the running of the farm would fall squarely on Applejack. However, she managed to do that. It's not exactly a big change, but it would require her to conquer that pride and overconfidence in herself to do so. To say, we're going to need help, we're going to need to hire help, and then going into the process of actually getting a hold of people to do work around the farm. These are all things that would take a certain degree of humility and maturity to do. And so where does that leave us now? Well, there's exactly one more. And for this one, we're going to have to go all the way back to before the beginning of the series, you know, via flashback, all the way to the end of the series in the very last episode, and that is Spike, our audience surrogate. And why is that? Well, because Spike, as he has always been, is the main philosophy of this show. He is our avatar of maturity. The entire process of it. Of course, we saw that Spike began out or began as an egg, and then he hatched. We know that he is a few years old by the time the series actually starts, because he's able to get up and help Twilight with various things. I mean, you gotta figure. He's probably only like what, maybe three, four, five years old by the uh, beginning of the series. And he's already helping Twilight with all of the uh, all of the librarian tasks. He fetches books, he shells books, he does research. He may actually be the smartest character in the entire show. Just saying, keep keep it on the down low, but he actually may be the smartest character in the entire show. So he is a child, and over the entire course of the series, he becomes an adult. In every single way. Not only does he have to learn every single lesson that the others did as he grows up, but he also gets to go through all the different changes that we all go through. Every single one of us had to go through puberty at some point. It was not fun. Nobody enjoyed it. And neither did Spike. In fact, his was rather blatant. We got to see him actually growing bigger. We got to see him covered with all kinds of blemishes and spots and scratching and everything else. And he even had to cocoon himself. Kinda. He turned to stone, I think. Pretty sure he turned to stone. I mean, he got better. But he had to go through that whole change as well. And then afterwards, we could officially call him Teen Spike. You know, kind of like Teen Gohan. Who wasn't actually a teenager, but, you know, it works. So we got to watch Spike as he, he grew up into, you know, kind of a young adult there. Once he did, he add, or we got to add on to all of his responsibilities. He was able to do more. He grew in confidence and learning from those around him. He was able to conquer many of his own flaws. And that carried him through the majority of the series. Until we get to the very end. So he started off as an assistant to Twilight. Just to Twilight. I mean, that's all that really mattered. He followed her everywhere. He was utterly reliant on her in every single way. So how do we end the series? Well, he's an adult now. Like, fully grown adult. As in, like, hold on. I, I think I have a picture of this. I do have a picture of this. So we're just going to open that up. And boom, there he is, Adult Spike. And so what, where do we see him at the end of the series? Well, he's still in Canterlot, he's still hanging around the castle and everything, but what's become of him? Well, we don't actually know for certain. What we do know is that by the end of the series, Spike has been making frequent trips between... Equestria and the Dragonlands. 
he may not be an ambassador on the same level as Pinkie Pie, but he is at least some kind of liaison between Equestria and the Dragons. Or at least a liaison between uh, Twilight and Ember. While he may not be a Wonderbolt, he is working to some degree with the Canterlot Guard. Now, if the Wonderbolts are basically the equivalent of the Blue Angels, which are part of the Navy, I do believe, then that makes them paramilitary at least, if not outright military, which means that Spike working with Rainbow Dash, working with the Wonderbolts, and working with the Canterlot Guard means that he's also simultaneously a liaison between Twilight and the military. He doesn't really have much to do with the other ponies as much. However, he still remains by Twilight's side, not as much as an assistant because she doesn't need him to shelve books anymore. But whereas everybody else has their own little contributions to make here and there, Spike, as the one person who has collectively learned every single lesson that's been put out there and grown up through all of this, has moved from being her assistant doing what she's told, or doing what he's told, to becoming her advisor and telling her what she should do. And it means that everything has come full circle. He has gone from being a helpless egg and a helpless little hatchling to a child with growing independence, growing knowledge, to a teenager and young adult with new abilities and new responsibilities, to becoming an adult and now imparting the wisdom that he has been given his entire life back to those who imparted the wisdom on him in the first place. And this, I do believe, encapsulates the entire philosophy of My Little Pony in a single character. The series as a whole has many lessons to teach, and all of them revolve around a singular focus. The idea that time will pass, you will grow up, and as you do, not only does this show tell you when to grow up, but it also tells you how to, so that you can go from being a student to a teacher, from working a job to following your passions, from being somebody who is utterly insignificant living above a bakery to traveling to foreign lands representing an entire nation. Spike has encapsulated everything in it. And again, as Spike being the, the surrogate for us, this is supposed to be our takeaway, our lesson. Just as every single episode ended with a lesson being sent to Celestia, this is what we were supposed to learn the entire time. And me personally... I think they did a masterful job of it. And I even see somebody new in the chat. I've never seen you before. Fubar42 says, Strange. I've never watched My Little Pony. I'm still going back later to watch this from the start. Perhaps I'll try to get a plot synopsis first. Sounds based. Believe it or not, actually, it's incredibly based. It really is. Every single lesson that My Little Pony had to give was couched in tradition. It was couched in reasoning and experience. I would dare say that the people that wrote it, almost every single lesson imparted into the show was taken from their own direct lifetime experiences, which means that just as Spike was having all of this wisdom passed down from the ponies to him, by extension, it was probably the writers passing down their experience from themselves to us. 
The entire story was just one story of growing up. So, not to belabor the point, but if I had to give my two cents on it, which I think I just gave about 50 cents, that, I believe, is the philosophy of My Little Pony. This might have been suggested as kind of a joke, but while it might have been a joke, it's often jokes that tell us the most truths. I mean, never let us forget that it was in the, the, uh, the king's court the jester was the only one who was allowed to actually speak truth to power. So even though this might have been just a joke thrown out there, just to say, hey, can you do an entire lecture on My Little Pony? Actually, yeah, yeah, we can do an entire lecture on My Little Pony, and it will be incredibly poignant and incredibly relevant. And if you haven't seen it, if you said My Little Pony... The show for girls? I'm not going to watch that. I would implore you. Go back and give it a try. It is nine... Eight and a half seasons. Eight and a half seasons of joy. In, in every sense of the word. For me personally, I actually treasured the time when I got... When it was still coming out and I got to see it because... It did give me that, like, half an hour every week when I would just simply shut everything out and for just a half an hour, just 20 to 30 minutes, nothing else matters. The world was not going to end in 20 minutes. So, I, I, I genuinely enjoyed that, and I took away a lot of things from the show as well. It was definitely worth it. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to cut this one off here. I think this has been a very productive little lecture. Even if, you know, the subject might drive some people off. Regardless, I hope they will come back and I hope that you'll come back because I'm still trying to do these every week if I can. I'm kind of running out of topics. I didn't have a long list to begin with, but I have a couple more. So what I'll say is if you haven't subscribed already, do subscribe to the channel. If you haven't hit the bell icon, make sure you hit that too. Otherwise, you know, you might not get notified. Then again, you might not get notified if I hit the wrong button too. So, I can't make any promises there. If you know somebody else who also might enjoy this, share this video with them. Especially if they're one of those people that said, My Little Pony? Really? I'm not watching that. Share this video with them. It might change their opinion. Other than that, um, do me a favor, uh, leave a like on the video, or on the stream, well, or afterwards on the video. Go ahead, leave a comment down below, especially if you have any ideas that you'd like me to cover. I will try and cover basically anything. Um, and I guess I'll see you next time, for whatever it happens to be. Don't forget... Uh, the chill stream basically is on Sunday, so if you want to be here for that, we're going to be working on more tabletop game stuff. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. And until then, take care. <laughs>